Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about transport across the plasma membrane. And as a quick review, let's talk about the plasma membrane. Remember that the plasma membrane is made out of primarily phospholipids. You can see here that we have a picture of a phospholipid, and you can see that it has two portions to it. One is called the head, it's this round part right here, that contains the phosphate, and it is charged and polar and hydrophilic, meaning it likes water. Then it's got these two tails that hang down, these two fatty acid tails, and those are hydrophobic. They do not like water. They're uncharged. And because they don't like water, they try to hide in an aqueous environment, such as the body. So inside the body, we have lots and lots of water. Outside the cell, out here, there's water. Inside the cell, there's water. And so this phospholipid bilayer will arrange itself in these two layers so that the hydrophobic tails are hiding away from all that water inside, and the hydrophilic heads are facing either outside the cell or inside the cell. And because we have this hydrophobic core, it allows the plasma membrane to be what we call semi-permeable, which means some things can come through and some things can't. The types of things that can come through are small molecules that are not charged. They can go right through because they don't mind that hydrophobic environment inside of the plasma membrane. So if it's small enough and if it's uncharged, things can move through. However, things that are charged do not like a hydrophobic environment. And so they're not going to want to go all the way through here to get to the other side. We're going to have to have some other mechanism to bring charged particles across. Really large macromolecules are not going to be able to move through because they're just too big to fit. So they will not be able to move through either. We do allow water, which is not charged, but it is polar, to move through by using aquaporins or little channels that are specific to moving water across the plasma membrane. So again, Semi-permeable means that some things can move through, uncharged molecules and molecules that are small, but large macromolecules or anything that's charged is not going to be able to come through the plasma membrane. So let's talk a little bit about gradients. So imagine I sprayed perfume. If you and I are sitting in the same room. I'm sitting on one side and I sprayed perfume. The perfume would smell very strongly near where I am, and then it would go and be not as concentrated near where you are at first. But after a little while, those little molecules of perfume would start to move away from where I originally sprayed the perfume. And after a little while, you'd start to smell it. A concentration gradient is simply a change in the concentration through space. So you spray the perfume over here, very, very strong over here, not very strong, not a lot of molecules of perfume over there. That creates a gradient. Now, these molecules are all moving around and they're bumping into each other and bouncing off of each other. As they move away, if they go in this direction, they're less likely to hit each other. If they try to go this direction, they're bumping into more of each other because there's more molecules in that direction. So as you move away from an area of high concentration, you are able to find a little bit of space, and we call that diffusion. Diffusion is just the movement of molecules from a greater to a lesser area of concentration. So the molecules that are moving this direction are diffusing away from this greater concentration. And if you imagine trying to go in this direction, it would be pretty easy. It's a lot easier to go this way than it would be to fight your way in that direction. We actually call this passive transport. Passive transport is the movement of molecules from greater to lesser concentration, and it doesn't require any energy because you can just move down the concentration gradient. 
So down the concentration gradient or with the concentration gradient basically means you're moving away from all this congestion up here. If you wanted to go the opposite direction though, it would be like trying to walk upstream. So we call that active transport. And to go upstream like this requires energy. You're going to have to push molecules out of the way and fight to get back towards this high area of concentration. So passive transport is moving down the concentration gradient, and active transport is moving up the concentration gradient. In the body, passive transport doesn't require energy. Active transport does require energy. And there's a couple of different types of passive and active transport. So diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion are all passive transport processes. In passive transport, the molecules move from an area of high to low concentration. These do not require cellular energy to do because it's easy to go down the concentration gradient. In active transport, the molecules will move from an area of low to high concentration, and this does require cellular energy to move them. So we have active transport, and we have a couple of others that we call bulk transport, where we're moving a lot of things at once. Endocytosis and exocytosis are examples of active transport that do require energy. So our first type of passive transport is diffusion, and this is where we're moving something from higher concentration to lower concentration. So you can see you have your lipid bilayer, and you've got a lot of molecules on one side of the membrane. Clearly there's a lot on one side and none on the other side, which gives you a concentration gradient. Your concentration gradient is going to go this direction, and if we're going to allow this stuff to go through the plasma membrane, it's going to move down the concentration gradient. So this is diffusion because the molecules are moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration right through the membrane. And you can see this starting to happen. Molecules move through the plasma membrane until they eventually equal out. And there are the same number on one side as the other. This means there's no longer a concentration gradient pushing molecules to move. Once the molecules have moved across the plasma membrane and have equaled out on each side, we call that equilibrium. We also call it isotonic, where there's the same amount of molecules on one side of the membrane as there are on the other side of the membrane. Remember how earlier in this video we talked about how not all molecules can move directly through the plasma membrane? This is because the membrane is selectively permeable. So what happens if we have a gradient, but those molecules can't move through the plasma membrane? We can't take care of the concentration gradient by diffusion alone. We need another type of passive transport to help us manage the gradient. Here we have a situation where on the left side of the picture, we have water, as represented by these blue dots, and we have something called solute. These are our molecules that are dissolved in water in orange. And you can see that on one side of the picture, you only have one, two, three, four, five molecules. But on the other side, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 molecules of solute. So you clearly have a concentration gradient. You have much more solute on this side than you have on the other side. Whenever I say solute, just think of stuff. So this is just molecules of some something, some kind. So you have more of them, more stuff over here than you do over there. So let's decide which way the concentration gradient would move if we were going to allow the orange molecules to even out. The gradient would force molecules to move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So our concentration gradient would go that direction. However, remember, we have a selectively permeable membrane in between these two compartments. And what if the stuff, the orange stuff, couldn't go through the membrane? If the solute can't move down its 
concentration gradient, we're going to have to allow the water to move in the other direction to help even out this imbalance. This is called osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. The water will dilute this side and concentrate that side. So which way will the water move? Well, the water is going to move towards where the stuff is. The water will move in this direction, from the left to the right, and it will dilute the concentration of solute over here, and it will concentrate the amount of solute over there. This movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane is known as osmosis, and it is a type of passive transport. It relates only to the movement of water. And the way to remember which way the water goes is the water's always going to go towards where all the stuff is. So remember on this picture, we had the stuff over here. The water will move towards the stuff. Okay, so remember we've already talked about isotonic. Isotonic is when the solution is the same on both sides of the membrane. Hypotonic means that the stuff, the amount of stuff, is smaller on one side. And hypertonic means the amount of stuff is bigger on one side. In this situation, the hypotonic side would be on the left because there's less stuff. The hypertonic side would be on the right because that's where more stuff is. Let's talk about how this actually works in a cell. Say you had a beaker of water and it had red blood cells in it. If you look at the amount of stuff that's inside the right red blood cells and the stuff that's out here in the saline solution, it's the same amount of stuff. So that would be isotonic. In this case, the water doesn't need to move into the cell or out of the cell because the amount of stuff on both sides is the same. However, if you have a hypotonic solution, so for example, pure water has a lot less stuff in it than what would be inside one of your red blood cells. The water is going to follow the stuff, so it's going to go into the red blood cells. What this does to the cells is it causes them to swell enormously, and they could potentially burst. All that water rushing inside to dilute out all the stuff could be catastrophic for the cells. The opposite situation is something called a hypertonic situation. So if, say you put in too much salt or too much sugar in an IV, those red blood cells would be sitting in a solution where there's way more stuff outside the cells than inside the cells. This would cause the water to move by osmosis out of the cells. And so much water could leave the cells, it would cause the cells crenate and shrivel up. And that's also pretty bad for the cells. The way to figure out these questions about isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic is figure out where the stuff is. Wherever the most stuff is, the water is going to follow. And water can either harm the cells by causing them to blow up, or harm the cells by completely leaving and allowing them to shrivel. We like to be in an isotonic environment where the amount of stuff inside and outside is the same. So osmosis is just the movement of water across a selectively permeable membrane. Our third type of passive transport is what we call facilitated diffusion. And do you remember when we talked about how charged particles like ions, sodium ion or chloride ion, can't move through that hydrophobic environment inside the, the phospholipid bilayer, how do we actually get them across? We use something called a carrier protein. Now here we're showing glucose moving across. Glucose is a monomer of, carb of carbohydrates and it doesn't normally go through the plasma membrane. And so we have a special protein that will carry it across, kind of like a tunnel. We're still going down the concentration gradient. You can see there's more glucose outside than inside. And so it's still passive, but we're using a special tunnel to get them through. So that's called facilitated diffusion because we are helping it out. 
act of transport is different. Now we're moving things against their gradient. So, for example, you can see there's quite a bit of sodium out here. And we're continuing to pump more sodium out. We're pumping it against the gradient, so kind of upstream, if you will. In order to do that, we need to use energy. One way we use energy is by hydrolyzing ATP and using the energy released to run this pump. Don't forget, active transport requires energy because we're moving molecules against the gradient. A couple other types of active transport would be phagocytosis, in which a molecule is engulfed by the cell and brought inside. Penocytosis, in which the extracellular fluid becomes engulfed by the cell and is brought inside. And receptor-mediated endocytosis, where a solute that's outside the cell binds to a receptor and triggers endocytosis and bringing things into the cell. Those are all active transport mechanisms. So in review today we talked about the difference between passive and active transport. Passive transport is we're going down the concentration gradient. We're allowing the flow to carry the molecules with it. Active transport means we're going upstream. We are going against the concentration gradient and this requires energy to do. So we talked about three kinds of passive transport, diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. Diffusion is just the movement of molecules. Osmosis is the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And facilitated diffusion is using a carrier protein to carry something that wouldn't normally be able to move across the plasma membrane because of the structure of the membrane. Active transport processes, we talked about phagocytosis, penocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis, and how we are using energy from the cell to pump something against the gradient. That's it for today. See you in class.